In this video, we're going to be talking about benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV, and answer the question, what is it? But also, uh, what would lead you down the path to suspect that a patient has BPPV? But before we go there, let's just talk generally about vertigo. Vertigo is really an umbrella term. There's a lot of types of vertigo, but in general, it's the false sensation of movement and the only type of dizziness that causes the sensation of spinning or whirling. So patients with vertigo might describe this in a number of ways, like a feeling that you're standing still and the world is spinning around you, or a feeling as if you're spinning around while the world around you remains static. And vertigo is often going to be accompanied by other common signs and symptoms like nausea and vomiting, loss of balance, difficulty walking, and in some types of vertigo, like BPPV, nystagmus. And if you don't know what nystagmus is, we're going to be covering that specifically in a separate video. And whenever I make that, I'll put a link in the description of this video to that. Now, if you've never experienced vertigo of any kind before, you can imagine it's going to be difficult to understand what it truly feels like. And while it can present differently in different people, this video right here that I've made, and the next one also, gives you kind of an idea of what it might feel like. The room is spinning. You're dizzy. And as you might guess, it's often accompanied by other symptoms like nausea and even the need to vomit. So if you're doing one of the diagnostic tests for BPPV, like the Dick's Hole Pipe Maneuver, you can imagine you might want to have a trash can nearby in case the person feels the urge to vomit. So what causes vertigo? Now remember that there's three body systems that give the brain an idea of where the body and the head is in space. Those are the visual system, the proprioceptive system, and the vestibular system. And in the case of vertigo, there's a mismatch between the information that's coming in from the vestibular system and the information that's coming in from both the proprioceptive and the visual systems. And we'll assume that the information coming from vision and proprioception is normal and healthy. And so if there's errors coming from the vestibular system, there's a mismatch now. And now the brain doesn't know what to perceive, and so it makes the person dizzy. One example of something that can cause vertigo is actually alcohol consumption. This is because alcohol changes the viscosity of the fluid within the semicircular canal. And it's true alcohol does other things, but that's one of the things that it does. And if the viscosity of the fluid within the semicircular canal increases, then that changes its dynamics and that creates a mismatch between the vestibular information going to the brain and the information coming from the other two systems, visual and proprioception. So if something changes the dynamics within the semicircular canals, it has the potential to cause vertigo. However, in benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV, there's two specific things that have to happen to cause the signs and symptoms we just talked about. Number one is abnormal displacement of these tiny structures called otoliths from the utricle, and they then move into the semicircular canals. So these otoliths are microscopic, pebble-like structures that normally play a role in the detection of linear acceleration in both the saccule right here and the utricle. And the utricle and saccule combined are both a part of what we call the vestibule. But sometimes those autoliths can become displaced from the utricle and move into these semicircular canals, which you can see are technically connected and continuous with the utricle. And then number two, different head movements that move those autoliths throughout those semicircular canals. And so long story short, you have to have autoliths abnormally move from the utricle into the canals, and then the head movements move those autoliths through the canals. Let's do a brief review right here. This entire structure shown in the picture, the whole thing is referred to as the cochleovestibular apparatus. If you imagine a line drawn right here, everything to the right of it, all this, is the cochlea, which is involved in hearing or audition, we might say. We're not concerned about that right here. But if you look at the same imaginary dividing line and look at everything to the left of it, all of this would be the vestibular apparatus, and it's involved in vestibular function, basically balance. This part right here is referred to as the vestibule, and the vestibule really has three parts. It has, number one, the connection to the cochlea, but then also has two specific organs. One is the saccule, and the other is the utricle. The utricle and the saccule are involved in detection of linear acceleration. 
The saccule is closest to and actually continuous with the cochlea over here, whereas the utricle is closer to the semicircular canals, and again, it's continuous with them. If you look at the utricle coming off of it, you actually see some enlargements right here. These are called the membranous ampullae, or sometimes it's called the ampullae. A singular would be ampulla. Each one of these ampullae is going to lead into one of the semicircular canals, and there are three of them. This one going up superiorly is the anterior canal, and sometimes called the superior canal. This one going in the back is the posterior canal. And the one that is actually within the transverse plane is called either the lateral canal or the horizontal canal. And each one of these is going to connect back with the utricle via one of these enlargements called the ampulla. Here's a close-up view of one of the semicircular canals. This enlargement down here is the ampulla, and recall that it is connected to the utricle of the vestibule. Also within the ampulla, there is a gelatinous structure called the cupula, which we'll get into more detail in a minute. And then throughout the canal, there is a fluid called endolymph. So the cupula here is actually connected to hair cells, which are in turn connected to the afferent fibers that go to the vestibular nerve. And each one of these cupulas is going to have multiple of these little setups where there's one large kinocilium, which is always the longest one, and then there's 40 to 70 stereocilia, which are just much smaller cilia than the kinocilium. So when there's acceleration through head rotation, basically the rotation is speeding up, the stereocilia are going to move toward the kinocilium, and when they bump into the one kinocilium, that's going to trigger an increased rate of depolarization through these afferent fibers that go to the vestibular nerve. When there's deceleration of head rotation, the stereocilia move away from the kinocilium, and that's going to decrease the rate of depolarization. So if you look at this first thing right here, each one of these peaks represents um, a depolarization. There's always going to be a tonic firing rate, okay? just a baseline level of firing. But then if we get acceleration, now you've got those stereocilia moving toward the kinocilium, and that's going to be detected by the hair cells, which are then going to trigger an increased rate of depolarization by those fibers going to the vestibular nerve. That would be acceleration. But then eventually that acceleration is going to start slowing down and you're going to get deceleration. When deceleration occurs, those stereocilia are going to move away from the kinocilium, that's going to be detected by the hair cells, and then they will trigger a decreased rate of depolarization uh, through those afferent fibers going toward the vestibular nerve. Here's a scanning electron micrograph image of one kinocilium and a bunch of stereocilia. It's hard to tell which one is exactly the kinocilium, but there's going to be one of them, and then definitely these smaller ones down here would be the stereocilia. Now remember, within the saccule and the utricle, we're going to have those little structures called autoliths. They're literally calcium carbonate crystals that form the basis of the sensory organs within the utricle and the saccule. These are scanning electron micrograph images of them, and they literally are crystals. But remember that sometimes those autoliths within the utricle can be abnormally moved into the ampulla of the semicircular canal or the canal itself. And in BPPV, you no longer just have endolymph moving through these canals, you also have the autoliths. And so even after rotation has stopped, you're either at constant velocity or you're static, you still have the autoliths moving through here. And they can bump into the cupula displace it, and you get this whole physiology that happens relative to the kinocilium and the stereocilia. And so now, when you shouldn't have either an increased or decreased firing rate, you do. And this leads to a mismatch between the information that's coming from the vestibular apparatus and the information that's coming from your eyes. And that's what produces the symptoms of BPPV. So one of the chief complaints for somebody with BPPV is going to be dizziness. They're going to complain that they feel like the world is spinning. If that's the case, then you probably should conduct a vestibular ocular motor screen. Uh, some of these first few tests, like smooth pursuit tests and convergence tests, 
saccadic eye movement test, VOR cancellation test, when these are positive, they indicate that the person may have a central deficit. BPPV is not a central deficit. So if these are positive, you should probably explore a central deficit closer. But if it's true BPPV, these will probably be negative. Also as part of your screen, you might do a head thrust test. When this test is positive, it indicates that the patient may have a peripheral deficit, also called a peripheral hypofunction. BPPV is definitely not central, so these would be negative, but the head thrust test can be positive in those individuals. Now, in BPPV, the signs and symptoms are both triggered and episodic. By triggered, we mean that there are known aggravating factors that can reliably reproduce their signs and symptoms. Those could be positional changes, like going between supine and sitting. They could be rolling in bed, because that does involve head rotation, or even just simple rapid head turns. That could be when they're driving. It could also be when they are in the grocery store looking between aisles. Now, these are things that consistently reproduce their symptoms, so they are triggered. And then the symptoms are episodic, meaning they're not continuous. There are defined episodes where they start and end. If the symptoms were continuous, that may suggest an acute vestibular condition like vestibular neuritis or even a stroke. If you have all these things and you're suspecting that the patient may have BPPV, you would then proceed to doing one of these two diagnostic maneuvers, which are the dix hall pike test and the horizontal roll test. And those are what we'll be covering in the next couple of videos. After that, we'll go into more detail on the treatments, which are basically cantilenth repositioning maneuvers. So make sure to join us for the next few videos. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.